I think we're live. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see or have joined yet. So um, good morning. Happy World Wildlife Conservation Day. So excited to have everybody join on this incredible day. Let's take a look here. If you're here, please go ahead and uh, send us a message. Let us know you're there. And also, I would love to know what groups you would recommend for going to in this time of giving, in this time of charity. A lot of people are thinking about different groups. We would love to know what groups you recommend, as there are a lot of NGOs out there that need money, and we want to make sure that we, we can help in any way that we can. So, happy World Conservation Day. Welcome back to the Conservation Conversation. It has been a long time. It's so great to see everybody again. Hey, Nicole, Harambe Foundation, absolutely. Now, the Harambe Foundation is an amazing organization. Uh, I met them as I was working on the Harambe documentary, and the Harambe Foundation is actually taking money and donating all of it to boots on the ground projects in Africa. So if you love gorillas and you really want to help them, go to the Harambe Foundation, check it out. They've got some things for sale. You can take some, uh, you, you can do some donations and all of it, 100% of it will go to the boots on the ground projects. That is poacher reform. That is additional assistance for people that are, are having a lot of issues down there right now and also to help the gorillas. Uh, that is a whole uh, entire story that we have coming up that I've been learning about as I've been working on the Harambe documentary. But uh, I know the Harambe Foundation uh, gives a lot of money to one of my favorite um, sanctuaries, the Limbe Sanctuary, and that is down in Cameroon. And uh, Nicole, if, if you have a, a link for that, I'd love for you to put it up for everybody to check out. Hey, Heather, good morning. Uh, happy, happy we're back. I missed everybody. Thanks for being gone so long. I've uh, been working on a slew of projects and we have a lot of amazing documentaries coming up next year. Also, in the meantime, I have been back on my cancer medication, which is slowing me down a touch. Uh, so there we go. HarambeFoundation.org. That's, that's the website right there in the comments or the comments or the comments. <laughs> I don't know where they are in this page, but it's, ha it's great to see everybody again. Um, just to let you know what we've been working on the Conservation Conversation has been doing a few special episodes that we'll be bringing out next year that include topics on dolphinariums, deep well injections, and other harmful things, uh, human activities that occur all the time. We were lucky we were able to go and shoot the Harambe documentary. It's currently in post-production. It'll be coming out on Harambe's birthday coming up in May. 2022. So I can't wait. I'm going to keep everybody updated on that. Currently in post-production for a documentary about illegal deforestation in Romania and how it's affecting the very last group of brown bears in Europe. And it's driving them into extinction. And the documentary probes into ways that you can help and you can change that course of things. And there is a new documentary coming up <clears throat> that I'm very excited about. Uh, we've talked about it before on Cancer Alley, but uh, I'll be doing a big announcement and, and letting everybody know all the details of that coming up. And next year, we'll be helping. And uh, if any volunteers want to go, please talk to me. We're going to be helping guard sea turtle eggs down in Nicaragua between September and November. So very excited. Uh, that period is called the Arabata. And that is the, the one time of the year where all of the turtles come in. And unfortunately, especially because of COVID, poachers have been coming in and just stealing all of them. So anyway, what I'd like to do now is start getting into World Wildlife Conservation Day. It's awesome that it even exists to begin with, but it has been an incredible year. 2021, we have seen a lot of amazing ups and downs. Today, I wanted to look at a few of the news stories that have been popping up and then talk about solutions heading into 2022 and how every single person can change the world, whether it's your local community or the world on the other side of the world, the entire world. We're all connected. You know, it's like bodies of water. There's no individual body of water. The world is a giant body of water with just a few land masses protruding. So we have to remember that. And that actually, I'm very happy to, to start off with that because that is going to bring us to our first quote of the day. And as you know, we always like to start the show with a quote. This comes from Mark Beckoff, who is a professor. And uh, 
And his quote is, I think, absolutely perfect for what we're talking about today and what we should remember every day. Humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. Humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. I mean, all of us that think about the world around us uh, already know that, but I just wanted to give a hats off to that quote, which I think is beautiful and very, very inspiring. Um, let's take a look here. Who's, who's with us today? Hello, uh, Korapati. Nice to have you with us today. Heather, awesome. Uh, would love to have you down on the beaches there. I know uh, it, it's going to be an amazing experience. So we'll, we'll get back uh, to that. And, and anybody that's interested in joining me on next year's adventures, there's a variety of direct action campaigns, a variety of documentaries, projects, and awareness campaigns that we will be working on. It's going to be a busy year. I'm very excited. So uh, it says, uh, sir, how can people get awareness to conserve our environment? Wonderful question. And, you know, uh, that is one of the best questions out there. How do we get awareness? We find that a lot of times information that will help people make more informed decisions are kept quiet by the majority of the press that's out there. The majority of the press really does drop the ball. We all know that. We've all seen it. And the majority of the press is unfortunately uh, comes with its own perspective, although they pretend to be neutral. So one of the best ways, I think, is conversations. Um, talk to your neighbors. Talk to people that you disagree with. Talk to people that have a different perspective. Nobody is ever right. Nobody is wrong. We all just see the world differently. And, and the only way we're going to have a better future is if we can communicate. If we can't talk to each other, how are we going to talk to nature around us. If, if we can't unify, how are we going to unify with nature? So it is a long road. It is a big road and it's a lot of responsibility. But when you hear people talking about things that you disagree with, don't argue, but engage them in a great conversation because there is, you know, I, I think one of the most important things is to listen also. You know, a, a great example of this is the, the conundrum of poachers. Obviously, poaching is never a good thing, uh, and none of us want to see any poaching. At the same time, there's a lot of poverty that will lead to poaching. And until we start listening to what's happening to people in areas where poaching is, is becoming more and more prevalent, uh, we're not going to understand how to fix that problem so they no longer have the incentive to poach. And that's one of the big themes today we're going to talk about is money. And animal welfare versus animal rights. It's, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting topic. So I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on this. Um, so let's go ahead and pop right in. I would like to start off with a few positive things that we saw happen this year. And uh, it really is, um, I think we have a couple. Uh, well, actually, we'll start off. You know what? We're going to go positive. But let's start off with a few negatives that we have seen this year. A few challenges, I should say. Uh, now, this year, in the U.S. alone, we lost 22 animal species. They went extinct. They're never coming back. And, and you know, we might think to ourselves, there's thousands of types of animals. So what's, what's the issue? The problem is, is that uh, we are playing biodiversity Jenga right now with our world around us. If we lose 22 animal species... That is going to affect the food chain and the life cycle of multiple animals, which will affect the life cycle of the nature that the animals serve. Uh, we have to remember that everything in the world has a purpose. It has nothing to do with us. We're just observers. It has to do with what they provide in nature to each other, to other animals, and to the world around them. We all have great examples of that. Now, it is a challenge because only 3% of global land remains intact. Now, that's not much. So we're watching species be dwindled down all the time. And this 3%, we don't have much more. <laughs> we, you know, what are we going to wait till we get to 0.5% and then consider it a problem? No. This is one of our issues that we learned this year is that we have to rethink extinction. You know, um, I mean, a great example is the vaquita. Why did Sea Shepherd and other groups wait until 
there was like seven of them left to go down there and start helping. This is a big problem. And I'm not singling out Sea Shepherd, believe me. I think what they did was, was fantastic and the work they did was, was so important down there. But what I'm saying is we need to rethink extinction on a bigger level. When we are hitting critically low numbers, we need to rethink how to treat those animals. If there's seven left, it's over. They're not going to bounce back. We need to intervene a little bit closer. And, you know, we can do it. And that's what I wanted to share was we have a few victories. And the good thing is we have preserved multiple species. Now, one of the biggest victories I think that we had this year that I'm very, very excited about is over 100 countries agreed to protect 30% of the land and marine species by 2030. Now, whether they will hit these objectives or not remains to be seen. But we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. The only way we'll know is if they start changing policies from animal welfare to animal rights. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's just talk about a few victories here. This is incredible. Nepal is on track to double its wild tiger population by 2022. So we're not heading towards extinction. We're heading towards survival. Fantastic. Gorilla populations are rebounding in some sub-Saharan African areas. Please keep in mind the Cross River Gorilla is in danger of extinction with only a few hundred left. They have a very little chance of surviving unless something is done immediately and, and not just conversation. So there needs to be action. Um, the uh, Western lowland gorillas are still considered critically endangered and there's about 100,000 of them left. Now, again, rethink the numbers we're talking about here. We're not talking about, you know, 100,000 sounds like a lot to us, but that's just because of the way we quantify things. It is a critically low number that will endanger their survival. But we, we got more on that with Harambe. Uh, another one is the jaguars returning to areas in Colombia. The Iberian lynx bounced back from near extinction. Beautiful. And uh, endangered monkeys in Vietnam has quadrupled since 2000. And wolves have surged back to life through Europe. And amazingly enough, China is creating a national park to guard giant pandas. It's a giant park. It's not a sanctuary and it's not a zoo. This is something that is a, a very important thing, is really maintaining natural habitats. Um, so although it's a slippery slope, giant pandas removed from endangered species, don't know if that will bode well for them in the end or not. Uh, hey, Camilla, glad you're joining us today. Um, it's good to see you on here. And uh, Camilla works a lot with uh, conservation in the UK and also runs an amazing uh, vegan, all vegan market stand. And, and that's one thing that uh, is always been important was to watch the rise of people eating more consciously these days. We'll bring that topic back in as we continue to talk about one of the big dangers we face, which is microplastics. Um, and Corpati, I'd love to know where you live. And uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, I do apologize, but I would love to know more about where you live and what are the environmental victories or challenges that you all face where you live. Um, and uh, Heather says the Limby Sanctuary works with the Cross River Gorillas. That's excellent news. Uh, the Eastern Lowland Gorilla is very nearly extinct as well. So we have to remember we can't, we're not going to save animals by staring at them in zoos. We need to go help NGOs fight on the ground and protect them because it all comes back down to money. Now, as all of us in conservation know, uh, corporations have the money, conservationists really don't. <laughs> so it, it is a big change. But this year, we have seen an increase in funding for conservation projects worldwide. The UN has reported, I think it was over 350, I want to say three, maybe 350 a million raised for conservation-based projects worldwide. So it's, it's outstanding. So uh, what, what I want to do today, though, is, is let's go into a few more popular news stories that we've all seen. And then after the popular news stories, we're going to talk about how each and every one of us can make a positive impact on the world and, and can change perhaps the, the nature of some of these some of these stories. So what we're going to do is actually pop on screen here. Uh, I think there's a story that a lot of people are very familiar with, which is, here we go. 
All right, here we go. So uh, let's take a look at, um, sorry, let me, <laughs> we're not going to talk about the antioxidant superpower, but uh, let me just find, here we go. Uh, where is that window? So one of the big news stories this year, as many people um, remember, is, uh, here, let me just pop this image on that we can talk about, is they have given sentient recognition to octopus, crab, and lobster. Now, this is fantastic news. Again, a lot of us in conservation know, we already know that they're sentient. I mean, the octopus is actually one of the most amazing animals in the world. It's probably as close to like an alien as you can get. It's so amazing. If you haven't seen my octopus teacher, please check that documentary out. Absolutely brilliant. But UK law recognizes octopus, crab, and lobster sentience. Now that is a huge step forward. It's wonderful. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But at the same time, there are no additional protections being offered to these animals. And they are being swept out of the ocean at insane rates that is destroying the biodiversity and eventually will collapse all fisheries. Most fisheries have already collapsed. I've seen it firsthand. I've been to many collapsed fisheries, you know, and, and that leads to additional complications where people will travel um, and then go take a lot of other fish from other areas. One thing we all saw was when all of the fishing boats showed up uh, at the Galapagos to start fishing. So again, the world is just one body of water. We have different names. We think in boundaries. Nature does not. And the more we pollute it and the more we destroy it, the less chance it has to see tomorrow or the next generation. So th this, I think this is an interesting topic because this brings up the idea of, okay, they've done this wonderful thing by recognizing its sentience. And I do not want to take anything away from that because that is a huge first step in change. But what I'd like to do is share with you the idea of what is animal welfare versus animal rights and how does that play into where we are these days? Well, you know, when you're looking at groups to, to potentially add money to, I found this one called World Animal Protection. I thought this is outstanding. But it's, it's actually was a very interesting, um, I feel like their name is, is kind of a trick. Uh, they are actually an animal welfare versus an animal rights group. And in their website, I just want to read a little bit of their website to you. It says, um, people often ask why they're not vegan or vegetarian. The answer is simple. They want to uh, basically take care of how animals are treated. Now, it says, um, where do they say here? Okay. Uh, all right. It says, some organizations support uh, animal rights, while others, including us, support animal welfare. Here's the difference between animal welfare and animal rights and why we support animal welfare. Animal welfare refers to the animal's quality of life and how well an animal is coping with its environment. <clears throat> they say that <laughs> um, animal rights is a theory or a philosophy. Now, I'd love to know what your comments are on that. So what they're saying is that they are going to make sure that animals are not being abused before they're killed, whereas an animal rights person would say, do we need to kill these animals? And uh, so, you know, I think that's an important uh, issue here. Uh, it's an important thing to always remember, is a group that you're looking at animal welfare or is it animal rights? And how does that align with your philosophy on animal abuse in general? Um, you know, some of us on the animal rights side would say that uh, any slaughtering of an animal is abusive. Uh, and again, it comes back to sentience. So the crab is sentient, which means it's self-aware, which means it thinks and knows what's happening. It reacts. It is aware of what's happening to him or her. And, and animal welfare would say, okay, but it's still cool to kill it. So, you know, there, there's the difference. Um, and that is where we 
define ourselves. Now, now the important thing is that these two terms have never been uh, sort of at odds as much as they are today. And I think it's a good sign that people are recognizing this sentience and animal welfare, perhaps not being the opposite of animal rights, perhaps is a path to the logical conclusion. To me, it's a logical conclusion after you start looking at animal welfare that uh, personally, I end up in animal rights because if somebody tells me that an animal is sentient, I don't think it deserves to be abused, killed, kept in conditions that are terrible. <clears throat> um, and I, I feel like if something is sentient, uh, which I believe all animals are, but uh, you know, science is still catching up to what ancient civilizations already knew, every animal is sentient. But how, how can we um, harm and kill animals that we know are just as self-aware. It's an interesting topic, and it's one that needs to be explored further. And perhaps animal welfare is a is a stop, you know, on the train to animal rights. So hopefully, more animal rights will happen down the road. Now it does get into a lot of other philosophical views. There's veganism. There's vegetarianism. Um, you know, I personally, I'm a vegan. I have a lot of friends that are not, that are still wonderful animal rights fighters. So it's something that we all need to talk about and bring back into discussion. It's not an easy discussion, but is animal welfare doing enough? I'd love to know your guys' thoughts on that. Let's take a look at what kind of comments we got going on here. Uh, yeah, Heather says, fascinated by octopus. Hey, Vera, nice to see you. They are more intelligent than many humans. Absolutely. Um, and it is a shame uh, to just see them served as an appetizer. How can we take one of the, one of the most amazing and sentient animals and just make it an appetizer? Where have we gone off tracks. Now, you know, people will say, well, it's tradition or people didn't have anything but that uh, 200 years ago. Okay. But um, today it's a little different. Now, again, I am excluding very extreme places where I have been, where people have no way to grow vegetables or even buy vegetables. There's tons of islands where poverty is so bad and they're so remote that people do eat fish, which brings me to the next thing, microplastics. Now, if you do eat fish, and a lot of my friends do eat fish, um, personally, I do not. Uh, I like to swim with them, <laughs> and I don't want uh, them holding a grudge against me. Um, but personally, one of the big dangers that all my friends that do eat fish, please be careful, because microplastics have been found in almost every fish tested, and have now starting to be found in almost every person person's bloodstream that have been tested. Now, what is a microplastic? Uh, now, okay, yeah, um, it, I think Heather makes a great point. We have to do so much more for, uh, for this concept of animal welfare. So let's head over to microplastics. Now, microplastic is anything under five millimeters. Now, the problem is, is that plastics in general, industrial activities, for example, waste your plastic bag, plastic littering, um, plastic nurdles, that are spilled and transport are from the corporations. It's not just people, but it's, it's, it's actually the, the biggest plastic issue comes from corporations, not individuals. But um, <clears throat> once all that happens, the plastic breaks down or it fragments. And that's, that comes from UV. Uh, that comes from the sun. The sun will break down microplastics into microplastics. And they become what are called microbial, uh, microbial uh, elements in nature are things that eat away at plastic. So if even if um, you have plastic, uh, plastic PVC tubing, let's say, uh, next to your dock, that PVC tubing will become chipped, fragmented, and each of those bits that's under five millimeters will be then eaten by fish. Now, how do they get eaten by fish? What happens is uh, smaller organisms that fish eat will latch on to the microplastics and attach onto them. And then it goes up the food chain all the way to people or seabirds or aquatic life. And through the process of what is called biomagnification, by the time it gets into uh, a fish's bloodstream, 
and further from there, it magnifies its intensity, and we have what are called endocrine disruptors that come through these microplastics. So the reason that I bring a lot of that up is, um, and here I wanted to share just real quickly with everybody that don't know about PVC, I wanna bring this up one more time. PVC is one of the most toxic plastics on the market. It's becoming more and more popular. It includes so many toxic elements. And unfortunately, it's become commonplace because it's cheap, not because anybody wanted it or needed it, but because a company can make an extra buck by using it. And it has come to my attention that this has become a massive problem in Florida. Um, there is a company called Ocean Habitats that is putting out plastic reefs. Now, it seems like a good idea at first, but they are made from PVC and other forms of plastic. And, and putting any plastic into the water will result in microplastics, which will result in environmental poisoning, death to all animals around it, and it's gonna poison the bloodstreams of anybody that lives near that water. And that includes children. So uh, to me, it's, it's, it's been a big issue. And I have, I just want everybody to know, I have reached out to this group for about a year to ask them how they can continue to, uh, to throw these things into the river, into the water. And, and people are paying for them. There's even a guy named Captain Planet that is promoting them. It is absurd to me that anybody would promote the idea of throwing plastic in the water knowing about microplastics. Um, that is one of the things we have to tackle next year. We need to stop this practice. We need to stop people putting plastic into the water. We're trying to get plastic out of the water. Sorry, very personal topic. Um, I implore every, all my friends in Florida to rethink this concept. Uh, there are people that are unknowingly poisoning their own environments by adding plastic to their own water. And it is completely against any kind of logic. Um, anyway, uh, I wish people would become more aware, but not all can do better. I agree, Joanna, no doubt. Uh, unfortunately, and Joanna, it's a great point. And again, it comes back to these ocean habitats, plastic reefs. They will chip. We will get microplastics. It will poison the fish. People in Florida are going to be more and more poisoned. Scientists have already estimated that we eat about three credit cards worth of plastic a week through microplastics in our environment. Let's not add to them. Please, and, and if you are in Florida, please start questioning ocean habitats. They will not respond to me. They will not engage in a meaningful dialogue, and they will not sit down to talk about how their plastics, I mean, may not be harmful. So I would like to give them the benefit of the doubt, but uh, until they come to the table at the moment, it appears they're avoiding the topic because they know they're poisoning the environment. And I'm sorry, but it's not, you can't tolerate that. I don't, I don't care who or why, you know, so many NGOs steal money from, from people because they think they're doing a great job and they're doing something positive while other NGOs that are really fighting for the environment have a hard time raising money. Um, so don't listen to the marketing. Don't listen to people pitching you. Do your own research. Check it out. Is this NGO contributing or harming the environment? Now, you know, wildlife conservation, which all comes back to wildlife conservation, because anytime plastic goes into the water, we are destroying the fish, excuse me, and the environment around it. So there are long stretching ways we can do this. So one of the great things we can do is stop using single use plastics. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, the USDA demands that almost everything is hermetically sealed with, with plastic. So a lot of times food companies um, are having difficulties finding ways around plastic law. Uh, so plastic is being sort of forced into the economy and environment. By the way, to my friends in Florida, Florida also, I mean, I, I think Florida has some of the best env environmentalists out there, but at the same time, they have had politicians ban bans on plastic. Now these politicians, I mean, what is plastic, right? It comes from petroleum. 
It's, it's an oil and gas company product that nobody ever asked for. And we're all paying the health price for it. So rethink it if you can. Try to urge companies to push for different forms of packaging. Uh, it doesn't matter if they say their plastic is PBA free or anything like that. It's still plastic um, and it's going to break down and it's going to kill. So plastics. 2022, I think we can change things. And we already have. Uh, people have already been demanding a lot of change in that way. Um, so, and uh, yeah, Heather brings up a great point. Mega crops. Uh, mega crops are a massive issue. Mega and mono. Uh, um, you know, mono crops they just go through and then they burn the land afterwards and uh, try to renutrient it. But what you have is like a scorched earth type of approach to farming, which is doesn't make any sense, um, but a lot of the companies that do monocrops or mega crops are not worried about that. They have the money to, to do that. Whereas sustainable farmers and local farmers will use ways to cycle farming and, and real farmers know how to use the land. Corporations and companies don't. That's why they use pesticides. It's why they use scorched earth approach. It's why they do all this. Um, they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to find a, a bottom line to, to, to do their shareholders. So one way you can help is speak the language the corporations speak, which is money, and go start to support your local farmers. People that are working hard to provide for the local environment, local community, using organic local means. One amazing way, you know, we, we have to remember that, you know, I always hear in conservation, people are so negative. Oh, you know, people are the scourge of the earth. We're the problem. And you know what? It's, it does no good to think that way. Um, people are not the problem. Industry is the problem. I mean, simple fact, you know, and until the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have these issues facing us. It's industry. It's not people. Well, the problem at the moment, people can be the only solution and all of us can be the solution. So to me, it's very important that we remember we have the power to change the world. And one of the best ways we always talk about here on the, on the podcast is revolution through routine, right? If you go to the grocery store, if you're lucky enough to get your food from a grocery store and you're not surviving in the Amazon or out on the island or in remote areas where people have difficulties living, buy from conscious companies, buy from local companies. Don't support the dangerous habits and toxic habits of the major corporations. We all can change that because the moment we start buying more things that come in glass instead of plastic is the moment that the companies change ever. By the way, you know, but before the plastic was really thrust on us by companies, it was, I think it was like Coca-Cola and I want to say there was like two or the three major conglomerates. I have to double check. Somebody out there may, may know and want to correct me, but they did it as a way to save money on their bottles. When we had glass bottles, we had a great recycle program and there were no issues with that. And then suddenly they created plastic so they could make cheaper sodas and make more money. <clears throat> and, and we lost the glass. Uh, now, the cool thing is it's kind of made a comeback because it's a little retro and people like it. But um, the more we can show companies what we want and speak an economic language to them, and we can't be mad at them for not understanding the world through the heart, you know, their companies, it's not their job. Their job is to make money for their stakeholders and their shareholders. We have to recognize that and we have to speak their language, which is money, and show them what we want. And once they know what we want, they will change because if they don't, they're not going to be around. And that's the beauty of the power that we have. So don't ever forget, you have a lot of power to, to change things on a very positive levels. Um, and, you know, Kropati makes a great point. Uh, plastics are drained into the ocean. And again, uh, whether it, and, and you know, I, I just put a post up the other day, you know, we have to remember that plastics don't stay where they're thrown out. So you might throw out a plastic in New York City, but that is gonna go out into the ocean. It's gonna swirl around with all the currents and it's gonna end up somewhere in Europe. Um, there's a lot of sort of xenophobic stuff circulating through the conservation world about how, um, you know, people overseas are putting too many plastics in, in 
the ocean. And that is actually infactual and it's incorrect and it's not factual at all. The majority of those plastics do come from us, the United States. Um, we are one of the biggest producers and users of plastic. And a lot of our trash ends up overseas, whether we send it to them or where we, for example, China was buying our plastics and then turning it into polyester and then sending back polyester clothing to us. So, you know, it's not as simple as seeing a piece of plastic and saying, um, you know, oh, they must be doing it. The, the, the truth is we're all doing it, but others sometimes take more blame uh, different countries. So we have to solve our own backyards problem. We need to get our own house in order before we start looking around the world trying to tell other countries how to survive. Um, so one, one other last thing I, I did want to mention is that, you know, um, for World Life Conservation Day, we have to remember the conservationists are still in the line of fire. Just this year, there was that attack in Virunga. They, I think they lost six rangers at once that were killed. And again, it comes back to money and, and this being the biggest issue that we have. And the reason I want to bring this up is that 2022, how can we make a change, right? How, how, how can we succeed in finding a better solution, excuse me, for us and the world around us? One thing that is very important is I feel like, you know, when, when you see how many environmentalists and activists have been killed, anybody that stands up for the environment is considered a threat. The Department of Justice has made animal rights activists and environmentalists at the top of their terrorist watch list. Meanwhile, <laughs> we have all these um, hate groups running around and uh, they have no fear of prosecution because they're focused on environmentalists and animal rights. People look at direct action everywhere. Uh, good friends of mine, a lot of them go in, they do direct rescue and uh, they're all facing federal charges right now. So we need to we need to remember that violence is the language of money. Violence is the language of industry. It is not the language of conservation. Love is the language of conservation. And the only way we can move forward is by promoting and living and being an example of that. And one thing that bothered me in 2021 was the sudden rise of all these memes celebrating poachers' deaths. And I think that to me, that's a disgrace. Um, it's not how we should be acting. We should not be ever happy with any violence. We're, we're, we're advocating to stop violence against animals. We are part of nature. We are animals. We share 98% of our DNA with a gorilla. So, you know, we're not that different from them. And we can't continue to think we're going to change the world through the opposing team's playbook. You know, one of the reasons I, I say this is... Um, I mean, obviously, like, I think hunting is, you know, uh, especially like trophy hunting is, is a major issue. We had a massive problem where the United States reopened the allowing of importation of endangered species from trophy hunting. And that, you know, that that can't be done. That that is that is a major problem. That is something that definitely has to be addressed. But when we talk about poachers, for the most part, we're talking about people who have no choice because of the poverty and the financial situations they live in. And I know it sounds crazy coming from a conservationist to have an empathy for them. But again, we have to help those villages and those people. We have to address the fact that money is so bad. And if they have five starving children at home or even one, they are going to do what they have to do. And the problem is, is the only opportunities are the money that's coming from these syndicates and from these poaching rings. You know, these people that live out in these poor villages are not thinking, I'm gonna go get a zebra today and see what I can get for it. That doesn't exist. They are pre-ordered and they are paid and they are told to go do this. And a lot of them end up in the same trap that a lot of illegal loggers and, uh, are stuck in, where companies will ask them to go do this very dangerous work, illegal work, 
and then end up shortchanging them on the amount that they'll pay them. And then the people end up in debt for using the equipment from these companies. So we have to find viable uh, alternatives for them. And I do know that the Harambe Foundation, by the way, has been involved in, in helping pay for anti, um, or not anti-poaching, but poaching reform and giving people opportunities, economic opportunities outside of poaching. So it all comes back to those memes. And I have a very unpopular stance, I know, on this, and I apologize. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this as well. Um, you don't always have to agree with me. But to celebrate the death of a person is just as bad as celebrating the death of an animal. Now, when, when a poacher is killed, you're talking about somebody that died trying to feed their family. And now we have a family of starving people. And how are they going to look at um, poaching alternatives? They're, they're going to be raised uh, in a worse environment. They're going to starve. And it's just going to perpetuate the cycle. So, you know, and believe me, I understand. Like, there is a little bit when you see it, you're like, oh, well, you know, maybe that'll show them. But it's not that, you know, it's not their choice. They're not doing it voluntarily. And we have to remember that. And we have to find a way to address that. Because until we address poverty and financial inequality, we're not going to be able to save the animals. And we're, it's, you know, we got to get rid of this, um, you know, white savior complex of running around the world trying to tell cultures what they do is wrong. That's not going to save anything either. The only thing we can do is lead by example. You know, uh, so many people have open sanctuaries and they rescue pigs and other animals. And those are the people we should be focused on circulating their information and their memes and their support so that everyone knows the names of their local sanctuaries. You know, you have to Google it. Most people don't know the names of the sanctuaries that they live by, but they can tell you that this guy was killed by an elephant he was hunting. Um, we got to stop thinking in those negative violent terms. Like I said, to me, violence is the, is the language of money. Violence is the language of industry. Violence is never the language of conservation or environmentalism. And um, yeah, we have too much to worry about. Yeah, you know, Heather makes a great point. They became poachers. They were not, they did not start out that way. Uh, Joanna says, there's a website and a Facebook page called Wild Food. I believe they're in Greenland and recently killed four orcas and selling the meat online. Ugh. They killed four, but only harvested one. Yeah, that is, see, it's those kinds of things that are a shame. Um, but, you know, Joanna, unfortunately, we have the same problem here in America. Uh, it, it's everywhere, you know, it is everywhere. Um, the, wi the wild food market is massive here in America. People love eating you know, um, a variety of endangered animals. Uh, it's popular here. And uh, unfortunately, we need to stop all of this. Sally says, a Bureau of Land Management has a fast track on Mustang extinction. Oh, yeah. Sally, that is a great point. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, you know, a lot of what is left, and again, only 3% of nature in the world is left for animals. But on the other side of the coin, the humans just say, well, they don't, you know, we need to kill them so that they, their populations can thrive. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it makes no sense. So humans have become self-conscious. I would say that, you know, um, we've become sentient in 2021. We understand animal welfare. We understand animal rights. We understand that our relationship to nature must be changed, you know, just like the change in the UK, which I applaud, I think is amazing. But... The, the thing about it is um, we still have captivity worldwide that is a massive issue, and we still have uh, way too much abuse on animals, and we have way too many loopholes to allow endangered animals to be killed. Um, or, you know, in a zoo's instance, uh, they're talking about culling. Uh, they call it culling. Um, the endangered gorillas that are in zoos around because they have too many of them, but there's not enough in nature. So this imbalance is not going to bode well for the future. And it is something we have to consider. We need to, we need to, to think, we need to rethink 
you know, uh, what they did with the, the, the lobster and the octopus and the crab was use modern science to comprehend that they're sentient. We need to take modern science, modern time, and we need to go back and we need to re-examine things like captivity. And um, I, I think captivity, hunting, and industrialized food, uh, especially meat, because we're still approaching everything as if it's the 1900s. You know, we still have animals in cages for our amusement. That's just insane. You know, one of the things that is beautiful in the UK as well, and the UK is really taking a lead on this. And I want to give a big shout out to Peter Egan, who is not only a friend, but an amazing animal rights activist who has been fighting nonstop for better rights for animals. Um, and he works with Ricky Gervais and a lot of other people to constantly promote and push animal rights and to try to give animals a, a better life on the whole, the UK banned the use of elephants in zoos. Now, America, we have an amazing victory as well. We banned circuses. We banned the use of, of elephants in circuses. So there is a nice start. But at the same time, these elephants in zoos in the UK, some of them are moving to zoos in America. So if they're sentient, if the elephants are sentient, and one country has said, you know what, we can't, we just cannot, um, this is cruel, we can't do this. Why is another country saying, we'll do it? So, you know, we need a little bit more consistency. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, that, that has been um, something that I think we're all learning, though. 2021 has been a learning period. You know, in COVID, we saw a lot of issues, too, with zoos where people didn't go. There was no money. And the animals starved. Some of the animals were fed to other animals in zoos to keep the other, some of the more um, high, you know, uh, high selling animals uh, in zoos alive. Um, there was a lot of issues. So in a world where we can barely sustain animals in their nature, that we um, are keeping them in cement cages, and it's not, it's not helping anybody. And we did see it a lot this year. Um, and, you know, I'm not promoting to go to the zoo. But what I'm saying is <clears throat> because of COVID and their financial model went down, animal survival should not be based on a company's profit model <clears throat> ever. It's not our right. As, as the quote said, we are not apart from nature. You know, we are a part of nature. And we have to remember that. Now, one of the amazing things um oh real quick to before we get to our final solution we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes uh there was recently um an article about sri lanka and them putting uh what are called mouth bombs in elephants baby elephants and other animals now remember they are considered sentient so that's the same as as putting um, a bomb in somebody's piece of gum and handing it to somebody cruelty beyond belief but it's not a Sri Lankan problem. It's not a localized problem. Um, people need to understand that those are seal bombs. And seal bombs are used all across the world, but especially in America, mostly for squid fishing, but as a commercial fisherman's tool. Not all commercial fishermen, but mostly they give seal bombs to seals to stop them from eating their catch. So humans go steal the seal's food and then kill the seals in this incredibly cruel way because they think the seals are stealing the humans' food. It makes, again, no sense. And 2021 was a beautiful wrap-up in seeing that a lot of people have said, wait a second, this just doesn't make any sense. So I want to use all the tragedy of 2021 between the killings in Africa, of the rangers, the loss of so many species, but we have to remember it's an awareness. Now, the reason I'm here, there it is, behind me is an old, old um, sharpening stone. And a sharpening stone is the best sort of concept I think we can use for 2022. We need to take all of this tragedy and all of these problems and you know, like people throwing plastic reefs into Florida, waters, stop it. We need to take all the things we've learned and we need to use our sharpening stones inside of our souls to become more aware, more critical thinking, 
more critical thinking and, and more conversations. And again, please make them two-way street conversations with everybody you know regarding these type of topics because it's the only way we're going to move forward is through unity. And again, lead by example. You know, um, Don't get baited into a heated conversation where you start calling names and stuff. Like, The more we can converse with people, the more we can learn why they think the way they think, and that will help us eventually find common ground. So um, I encourage everybody to use their inner sharpening stones. <laughs> there it is. Uh, and that will work out there. Um, uh, Damien. Yes. Um, I was looking, couldn't find a petition against the Silverback calling in UK. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, no, so far um, people are, are trying to stop it, but they're not going to be able to stop it. I mean, it's it's a zoo's business. And this is another issue is the concept of animals as property. This is another idea from like the 1800s that we need to rethink and resharpen. Um, we don't own them. And just that concept alone sets an entire tone that takes us as a humanity in the wrong direction. So let's use everything we've learned in 2021. Let's use the comprehension that we, we know about their sentience. We know what we're doing is wrong in so many places. <clears throat> Let's not be overwhelmed by it, but remember that we are the solution. We have the positive answers. And what are we going to do? We can change the world. Now, one really cool, innovative thing is, has been um, created uh, by a friend of mine. Um, and if you guys don't know uh, Sir Ian Redman, please check him out. Um, he was with Diane Fossey back in the day, took the, the film of David Attenborough playing with the gorillas up in the mountains. He, for a long time, is a gorilla expert and has uh, luckily joined us in our Harambe documentary and helping us understand what happened that day and the fact that basically everybody misread what was happening. But again, we'll show you that in the movie. Um, Ian it comes in to talk to us. But Ian has started a thing, and here it's called Rebalance.Earth. Now, Rebalance.Earth is an amazing initiative. So here's the idea behind Rebalance.Earth. Um, please, I, I recommend everybody go check, check this website out. So rebalance.earth is the concept that major corporations, right? United Airlines, American Airlines, BBC, you know, even our governments are all paying carbon emission offset fees, which are doing absolutely nothing. They're, they're doing nothing. They're just paying this penalty for polluting our world. And that's not going to help anybody. So instead, we need to rebalance the concept. Now, how do we do this? We talked about money and poverty. Now, this concept is so beautiful. It, the idea is to pay local villages through blockchain to make sure that it doesn't get stuck in a government or a process or a bank. So much money gets lost in these things. Um, this goes directly to the community. So say a small tribe um, out in say South Africa has elephants. And these elephants are very important for biodiversity. So instead of saying, okay, you know what? You, you can get $4,000 if you go kill one and give us the tusks. Instead, Rebalance.Earth is working with the IMF to take that money, take that money and give it to the local communities to keep the animals alive basically paying the human community for the work that the animal is doing. Um, Ian talks about uh, gorillas being gardeners of the earth, gardeners of the forest, right? They bring seeds, they distribute them. Uh, they sleep in areas with a lot of light that comes down and they make bedding. Their seeds go in there. And so they're actually planting seeds in places where there's a lot of light. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing, huh? And then that will grow new trees and new, new things. So without them traveling uh, every day, without them moving around every day, without them eating what they're doing every day, the world will start to lose its biodiversity and the whole thing will break down. And that is what we're already seeing. But Rebalance is a really cool pro project because it is taking these corporations and instead of paying just useless money to nobody as like, a, oh, sorry, we ruined your world. Instead, 
they are now going to take that money and redistribute it to the local communities for the work that the animals are doing to save the earth and the people that now, instead of wanting to kill and poach these animals, they want to save them. And they've already started doing it with elephants. It's already a success. And I'm excited to see where it goes from there. So uh, I'm very excited about that. So these are the kind of amazing innovations that we are seeing in our modern time. So absolutely incredible. There's a lot of great innovations. There's a lot of great movements forward. A lot of great NGOs doing work. 2022 is going to be a beautiful year. We're going to be able to save more animals than ever. Guaranteed. There is more consciousness than ever. There is more conservation than ever. There is more conversation than ever. And coming out of a period of dark um, argumentation and violence, we are finding people wanting to have conversations, connect again, be positive, and lead with love, lead with empathy, lead with compassion. It's what we are. You know, we're not fighting for another, a different form of a violent world. We're fighting for a peaceful world. And um, the key to that is saving our animals and our environment. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody on the podcast already knows that. But I just want to remind everybody, you have the power to change the world. And you don't have to leave your house. And you don't have to spend money. And you don't have to donate to lots of things. Um, just changing the way you live day to day. And engaging in that world in a positive fashion can make a huge difference. So, um, yeah, Nicole, I, I agree. I think rebalance.earth is a really amazing, interesting approach. Um, and hopefully it can lead to other ideas. You know, the fact that countries have decided to go ahead and um, all try to preserve 30% of the land will of their nation will be a huge thing to save what we have and help it rebound because nature doesn't need us. <laughs> we, it really doesn't need us. It rebounds on its own. We don't even have to do anything. Uh, check the story of the orange roughy, right? A fish almost fished to extinction. So it could be sold in like Trader Joe's as a cheap alternative to white meat food. Terrible idea. Orange roughies live over a hundred years. They're massive. And that's why it was a big thing for the commercial fishermen. Terrible idea. Finally, they put a ban on catching them and they have rebounded on their own. They don't need our help. They don't need us mixing them and breeding them and doing all this stuff. Animals know how to do everything already. Um, we don't know anything about nature and we're learning little by little, but I, I would venture to say you probably know like 0.5% about understanding nature around us. Uh, Jason says, unfortunately, Safari Club International money is now needed more than ever as we're seeing by having their international gathering in Botswana. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Jason, I would love if you could put a link up and help us know more about that. Um, uh, I'm curious how they do, and I'm curious uh, where that money goes as well. I'm just, you know, um, curious to see. Look, uh, Sierra Club does a lot of amazing work around the world. They bring a lot of awareness. And again, you know, there are big organizations that can help, but we can change the entire world just by being conscious of these things don't bum yourself out stay positive you know it's not been an easy year for anybody we're all getting through it we're a community you know and let's lean on each other and let's reconnect with others and let's see how that can change 2022 and hopefully by 2022 wrap up we will find uh, uh, just an entire four-hour show of positive stories of change this year so I wanted to thank everybody for joining me again. I love being here with the community. I love our conversations. I think everybody has so many incredible, um, yeah, Chilean sea bass. Oh, Chilean sea bass, Patagonia toothfish. Um, another issue. And, you know, Jason, you bring up a great point. And I'm actually going to be doing a whole show about this um, fish fraud. Fish fraud and its issues, not only to the people that eat the fish, but to the world around it. Uh, Chilean sea bass, yeah, if everyone's not familiar with that, um, please check it out. It, it is one of the biggest instances of fish fraud aside from snapper. Uh, and yeah, if again, to my friends that do eat fish, please be careful. Don't eat farmed fish. 
Remember that most fish has microplastics in it now, and you're bringing that into your body willingly because commercials said it was healthy, and it's not healthy. Yeah, um, please be careful because if, if we poison ourselves by poisoning our environment, then um, we're not, we're not going to be able to go out and keep helping animals. So it's great to see everybody. Thank you, Heather, Jason, Nicole. Thank you, Sierra, uh, for being here today. Thank you, Camilla. Always great to see you on here. I really appreciate um, you joining us today as well, Joanna, and uh, everybody that came in to talk to us today, Karapati, um, everybody. Uh, remember, it is our world. Let's talk about it. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Please join me next weekend. I'm going to be reviewing an amazing book I read called The Last Fish. Uh, um, it's amazing by an author named August Ritchie. A beautiful, beautiful cautionary tale that's great for children and adults and uh, a, a tale of the ocean. Again, we only, our world is one giant body water of water. Uh, only humans have given it different names and think they own different parts of it, but they don't because water doesn't stay in an enclosed container. It moves. So um, it's all our world and we deserve exactly what we want out of it. Anyway, I appreciate everybody. Please give us a few more um, links. If you've got NGOs that you love that are out there helping, please add the links. I, you know, anybody that can help out help out this year. It's fantastic. Thank you, Bigfoot Journeys. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, everybody, I cannot wait to see you all again next week. And, uh, you know, I, again, uh, it was really nice to be back with everybody. I missed everybody and super excited. The shows will continue uh, from now on. We're, we're back. So look forward to seeing everybody every week, uh, every week. Hope you and your family are safe and everybody is healthy through this crazy time. Stay positive. And I can't wait to see you.